Hi, hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm your host, Liv, i.e. that woman who typically avoids philosophy wherever possible because this is not, generally, a philosophy podcast except for the time I went on and on about Atlantis and also today, kind of. <laughs> so I spoke with the absolutely wonderful Caitlin Bolding. Caitlin is a PhD student doing her dissertation on the Timaeus, and it shows. And not only did we just basically become friends within the first words we spoke to each other and then talked about life nothingness for like half an hour before we finally got to the content of today's episode, don't worry, I cut that out, but we also just went with whatever Caitlin wanted to talk about, or more like what she knows best, and that is Plato's Timaeus, which... Honestly, it blew my mind with how exciting and fascinating her insights into this dialogue and Plato broadly and everything in interconnected are. You may recognize the name, Timaeus, because that is the dialogue of Plato where Atlantis is first mentioned. And full disclosure, we did record this back in April, so the Atlantis series I'd done was a hell of a lot fresher when we spoke. So hopefully that doesn't result in any confusion for you all, but hey, feel free to listen back to that amazing series of episodes, because why the hell not? Caitlin provides so, so, so much context for the writing of the Timaeus and the Critias, and this introduction of Atlantis. It actually adds so much to my series on the work, because now we're looking at when Plato was writing, what was going on around him, and why why he was writing to begin with, what the context is on the people that he has telling the stories. It really introduces so many important aspects that I know you all will be fascinated by, as well as connections with mythology and Hesiod specifically. Whew. Plus, we honestly just had so much fun. I learned so much. You can hear me just taking it all in. Listening back, I'm like, Right. My brain doesn't process bits of history and philosophy as well as I process mythology, and everything uh, was clearly just swirling around in my brain as I listened. <laughs> I'm obsessed with this episode, not least because I really appreciate these added details on what Plato might have been doing when he wrote the Timaeus, but also just the historical aspects surrounding these dialogues. Just, it's so good. I can't wait for y'all to listen. Maybe I should stop rambling and just uh, let you get in here. Conversations, getting trapped in Plato's web, Timaeus, Atlantis, and Hesiodic myth with Caitlin Bolding. I'd love to talk more about the Timaeus, I think. Please. And, yeah. So I did a lot on the Critias mostly because, yeah, yeah, because I I don't think I read the full Timaeus because... Um, no one should read the Timaeus. Great, I'm my... glad to hear that. Yeah. I often feel like, oh, I should read the whole thing, but I'm also like, no, I'm just going to like get my context uh, from... This is my tagline. About I, <laughs> I always tell everyone, don't read the Timaeus. I think that, and I say Timaeus, but I mean Timaeus Critias because... They are, in my opinion, um, and this is something people argue about, but it appears that they are two parts of a trilogy that mm -hmm. was unfinished, right? So I think of them as one thing. Yeah. I mean, um, they also, like, nestle together completely. Yeah, exactly. So the yeah. Atlantis stuff is in both the Timaeus and the Critias. But, yeah, I think that working on the Atlantis section, it's like working on it's the biggest gap between how exciting people think your research is going to be and how exciting it actually <laughs> is <laughs> i have a lot of people i'm like oh yeah i'm writing about the myth of atlantis and they're like oh what book should i yeah. read and i'm like not the timaeus no no i have no recommendation <laughs> I, I just find it all so interesting because so for instance like i i mean i obviously covered 
like Atlantis in every way that I could find without ever once like actually like I basically was like I'm gonna keep all my research to the ancient world um sure. meaning that my research is Plato uh yeah and then like just briefly touch upon like how it got dark you know how it became a like myth of white supremacy basically yeah uh but otherwise like just not even touch upon any of the the like the bullshit around it i like i just did the 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 atlantis bit of the timaeus and and then the whole of the critias but right somebody recently met like sent me um a note about it and and i think it's just so hard to un- to like get across to people exactly how it functions as a mm-hmm. piece of writing because yeah. it's really hard to wrap your head around what Plato is and yeah. is not doing. And like, this is what I want to talk about because this great. is what this chapter of my dissertation is on. Oh, yes. And so, yeah. So this is something that I've been researching. And so I'm really interested in how Plato is engaging with Hesiod. And mm. that's sort of what the whole dissertation project is. The first chapter is on the myth of Pandora and how the myth of Pandora shows up in the Timaeus. So generally the Timaeus is most famous for the cosmogony, the creation of the world. And as a part of that, there's a big part where he does a creation of the human body, which again, sounds great. Don't recommend it. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like that's like the TLDR of Plato. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that some Plato is more interesting to read. And I think Plato is an amazing writer. And he, he has all of this wordplay. There's tons of puns. There's all of these, like, weird character things. I'm very interested in it as the genre conventions of the philosophical dialogue. Um, but, yeah, the Timaeus, I think, it becomes incredibly influential in the Roman world. And it's one of the, it's the dialogue that has the most reach and impact. And so it's, it's very impactful. And it's something that I took a class on the Smaeus at Dalhousie. Shout out to Eli Diamond. I wrote a terrible paper on like, what is the core? Because there's all these really strange concepts in the Timaeus. And then I studied in Germany and I took a class on the Timaeus in German, like a seminar. Wild. And I did not know German very well at the time, <laughs> but <laughs> I took this class and I was just like so confused still about what the heck was going on. And so then when I went to write my dissertation, I was like, yes, I should definitely work on this dialogue that I still am confused by <laughs> um maybe in the process of writing the dissertation i will understand the timaeus and no <laughs> i i do not <laughs> but <laughs> there because of all of this okay and i will tell you another thing and i don't know if this will make it in or not but the other thing that i'm really excited about about the timaeus is that my friend and i once went to an aerial silk show in seattle okay, that where was is this going to plato i'm so based excited <laughs> on plato's timaeus it was plato's what? timaeus as a like circus show and it was all about the sacred geometries and it was wild and i was like i wow. can't believe this exists i am I will, blown yes, away <laughs> yes yes um so that happened and i was like yes this is and at the end of it, I went up to the director or something, and I was like, hey, so I'm a PhD, and I, I work on this. <laughs> this is absolutely insane that you made this show. Like, it was about the element, because there's all of this very, the the hard part of the, about the Chinese is it's very mathematical and very scientific, and yeah, all about, like, changes of matter and states. But coming back around to what the dissertation is about, um, I'm interested in how Plato is dealing with his own canonical texts at the time. So Mm. for Plato, the text of Hesiod, which, as you talked about, I think it's oral poetry, right? So it's being, it was composed orally and then performed, and it's performed for hundreds of years up until the time of Plato. 
and it's performed at these festivals. So it's sort of similar to how we experience Shakespeare, but even mm. more influential. And so he's sort of, he's rewriting his own canon at that time in the Timaeus Critias. Interesting. I've never really mm -hmm. thought about Hesiod. I mean, I've thought about it as oral poetry, obviously, but like I haven't thought about it as being performed. I don't know why. I think it's just because it's, it, it's, like, it's sits didn't Yeah. It's so strange. Yeah. It, that's the thing. Like, it's it sits not... in a different place in my mind than, than Homer does. Like Homer feels yeah. performative in a way that Hesiod doesn't. So that's and really, yeah. One of the things about that is because Hesiod has all these genealogies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, things that Homer is so narrative oriented. Mm -hmm. And so that makes sense to us as what would be performed. But the genealogies are, they're one of the things that when you read them in English are very boring. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and yet I've done it them... countless times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think they make, you know, they make good, they're good for your show because you can pull these, they're such good sources of myth. Mm -hmm. um, but the poetry of them really comes about, you can tell that they're good more when you're translating the Greek because there's all right. of this sonic wordplay, these folk etymologies. Um, and so they're really worthwhile to translate and they're very interesting in translating them. Um, and so they would be nice to listen to and yeah. perform, you know, and like it, it's so there's this this festival culture of competing at festivals with oral performances. And the Timaeus is set at the Panathenaia, um, which is this festival celebrating Athena and celebrating Athens as a city. And at the, the Panathenaia is partially known for the competitions that are hosted at the festival, um, both athletic competitions and poetic competitions. Some people say that we've got both Homeric recitation competitions and choral recitations. Mm. Um, and other people argue that Hesiod would also be performed in that context. Interesting. So, yeah. And so I'm really interested in the fact that the Timaeus is a new, radically new cosmogony where things come about not through the process of birth, which we find in the Theogony, right? Mm -hmm. The gods giving birth. And that's how you fill out the universe, but rather by this craftsman figure. And so that's a big departure. And it's set at the time when you would be at a festival. So the people who are reading Plato, they know the context of the Panathenaia. And they think like, oh, yeah, I went to the Panathenaia and I saw Hesiod and I heard about the story of how the gods give birth and that's how you get the universe. But instead, we get this conversation and these speeches by Timaeus and Critias um, that Timaeus' speech is all about this cosmogony. Mm -hmm. And the process of the cosmogony is craft rather than birth. And then within the dialogue, there's a setup of a competition. And the speeches are guest gifts that are given back to Socrates in thanks for the speech that he had given the day before. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this sort of like gift giving, repayment, and also a competitive nature to that as well. Because that's a big part of the gift culture. Or even if you think of like the succession myth part of the theogony mm -hmm. but like myth of pandora prometheus exchange and you know this building exchange where you have to one up the thing that you're exchanging next um and so there's this element of competition within that that's at the level of the characters against each other but then also embedded within it the myth of atlantis which is not a myth as we've talked about mm -hmm. not us together yet but <laughs> as, you've talked as about, i have gone it's, on and on and on about. it's not a myth yeah no. and it's not a myth but it's a pseudo myth so it's really interesting to me like mm. why is plato making it appear like a myth and he yeah. gives it this pseudo poetic pedigree through the figure of Solon, but also through this like really complex 
narratological framing, right? Where he has this really dangerously complex because it really like it truly is dangerous because the complexity with which Plato presents this goddamn story. Yeah, we don't even get the story. We just... no, and like, but the com- the the like framing of it as like <sighs> so Solon told my dad, and then my dad told me, and these priests told Solon that like yeah, that even just that bit is what leads so many people to misunderstand, like unintentionally misunderstand it for being like an actual piece of history. So like this is the the message that I got recently um which was like and to be clear I'm not insulting this listener at all I think it's like a really common problem when we're dealing with trying to understand this but you don't have the background to sort it out but like this is why it's just like a huge problem it's like if people just misunderstand it this way but he was basically like you know, well, if Solon did really hear this, then these different yeah. things could be real. And I'm like, yeah, but you're misunderstanding. Like, the whole point is that, like, no, Solon didn't hear this because Plato has no connection to Solon. Oh, that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> like, you, you know who would love that? Plato. Plato. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is this is Plato's whole game, right? Like, Yes. He's setting this up. And then, so we've got the festival context to these dialogues. And that's the setting. And they're having this conversation at a dinner, right? So you're at this cultural event that takes place over multiple days. It's a big deal. Everyone comes into town and there's the side events, which are actually like probably more interesting where you're having these conversations with Timaeus, who, you know, he's in town from Southern Italy. He's reached the peak of all philosophy um, and Critias, who may or may not be like the tyrant. Okay, <laughs> the fact that Plato also puts this into the mouth of the same guy who is both his like uncle and maybe one of the thirty tyrants is wild. I have many thoughts about this, um, which I cannot substantiate in my <laughs> TBD. Read this chapter of the dissertation. Um, <laughs> but then within this backstory. It's at another festival that Critias learns the story. And again, this is a fiction. It's very yes. Borges. Have you read a lot of Borges? Like, no. okay, that's okay. He's got like these, <laughs> these short stories, um, like the story about the uh, Book of Sand. They all have these interesting narratological framings, by which I mean it's a story about how you learn this story. Hmm. Kierkegaard does this too in the either or where he says at the very beginning of this philosophical work I walked by this window with a dresser in it every day and then one day and I kept looking at this dresser and I always wanted to buy it and then one day I brought the dresser and I opened up the drawer and I found this book <laughs> it's like oh. what Kierkegaard like the <laughs> like he finds there's this framework for I didn't write this I found it right so giving a fake backstory is this thing that writers do and so I'm really interested in why Plato's doing this and how it relates to the context where he's setting this which is to say that he's trying to make his philosophical dialogue place that in competition with the poetry that's telling these myths that's being part the part of this festival so that's my like big argument (laughs) i'm taking it all in because it's plato and it's because it's these dialogues like it's just it's so hard i guess to like really fully wrap your head around it but on top of that it's hard to then express it (laughs) Like, I, I'm just sort of taking in everything based on how I tried to explain it all to people in my Atlanta series. And I think y- this definition is going to be so helpful. So I'm really excited that you wanted to talk about it because you understand Plato more than I do. And so I, I was just like, I don't have a background in Plato at all. I was just trying to do the Atlantis bit. And it it's just like his choice to frame it this way 
is so fascinating, but also, Mm -hmm. yeah, makes it so difficult to like actually wrap your head around later. (laughs) Okay. So the other thing that I will say that is really interesting to me about this piece is that he assigns this pedigree to a poetic pedigree to a figure who is responsible for really important things in Athens. So Solon the lawgiver Mm -hmm. and it's at this festival that's all about Athens and celebrating the, you know, what makes Athens, Athens, and also the pan part of the pan Athenia, which is bringing together these different um, tribes within Athens. And Solon goes to Egypt and there's another part there where the place in Egypt that he goes to is also like the sister city of Athens and governed by Athena. And the priest tells Solon that the Athenians are all children and that they don't have any intellectual depth. They don't have the same kind of um, length of knowledge Mm -hmm. because their stories and their way of conveying information and knowledge is continually wiped out by these fires and floods. Mm. And also, and, but in the Nile, things are preserved and they're partially preserved because they write everything down. And then the priests, preserve the written record so if we think about Hesiod and this Mm -hmm. culture of oral composition performance and then performance at festivals so still the way that we're the way that Plato is uh receiving this poetry Homeric and Hesiodic poetry which is again like 400 years or so before um is through these performances, this oral performance, and and Solon, he's he set up this fake story about how Solon's got an even older story because he was able to access it through the Egyptians because of writing. So this is another level of the kind of competition that Plato is mm. setting up with canonical poetry. Right. So this is me wrapping my head through non-mythological things in a way that I'm not used to doing. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I, I fooled you by coming on here and talking about philosophy. No, I am obsessed with it. Yeah. I'm truly so thrilled. But I'm also just like, this is so not my wheelhouse in a way that I'm like super interested in. But so and then the, the truth of kind of like, so I've actually, I've re- recently had um, a couple different people on to talk about uh, Egypt, uh, which is very helpful. But my understanding about, like, uh, and this is, again, this is going to be, like, very broad, obviously, but we were specifically talking about Herodotus um, in Egypt, is that, like, Egyptian priests, um, mostly, like, when it comes to things being written down, is that it's also, like, a lot of Egyptian um, propaganda and stuff. Like, they didn't really write down things that were bad. Um, Or, like, my understanding, basically, is just to say, like, it's just even more unrealistic that the Egyptians would have actually written down something like this. Oh, yes. Um, the Egyptians definitely did not write this down because it did not exist. Like, this Well, is that, yeah, that much I know. Right? Like, 100% yes. this is not a thing. But I mean, even if it, like, even hypothetically, the Egyptians yeah. wouldn't have written something like this down, even if it were hypothetically possibly real. Um, yeah, and then it. also, like, the question of Solon, obviously, like, he's, like, generations removed from Plato. So that's a whole other thing. Exactly. Like, no, none yes. of this is real. <laughs> yes. And and it's very interesting, too, because he, he first he says, okay, um, the Egyptians priest, the Egyptian priest has written down. There's also a really interesting demythologizing part of this where they mm-hmm. say the story of, I believe, Phaethon and... Mm-hmm the story of um, the floods, Kira. And Deucalion, yeah. And Deucalion and the flood. Those are ways of describing 
the ecological disasters that happened in your country, but you don't remember them because you don't have any, because your like collective understanding was wiped out at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, So I find that really interesting, Mm -hmm. but just to get back to the written versus oral tradition piece of it, Mm -hmm. the Egyptians, the Egyptian is saying we have this written record. And then from there, goes through it's orally transmitted from Solon to right. the great grandfather to the grandfather and then at a festival as a child Critias learns it and there's this emphasis on age like he learns it when he's very young and then even within the dialogue he practices telling it because he thinks mm-hmm. he might have forgot it so there's all of mm-hmm. this like memory and remembering through mm-hmm. oral performance that's a part of it um, which which then like keys into the performance as competitive as a part mm-hmm. of this competitive culture. And I mean, does that that does that tie into to like Plato commenting without commenting on the nature of memory and like what humans can and cannot like easily remember and how that ends up being stories like stories being flawed or is that sort of not? his interest necessarily so you know he does that a lot in other dialogues on writing specifically the phaedrus Mm -hmm. where that dialogue's all about there's another myth um and relationship there's another egyptian priest in this myth and Mm. um that dialogue's all about how you can't convey knowledge through writing and that writing down things means you forget them but if you don't have the technology of writing then your memory is better so in some ways it's it's sort of the opposite in that one um Mm -hmm. so he talks about that there i would say when we kind of zoom out to the i don't know if i'm going to talk about this super cogently but when we (laughs) zoom out to the timaeus there's this big theme of the ekos mythos and the ekos logos, which means mm. likely story, mm-hmm. um, either in likely story as likely mythos or likely logos, likely story, likely explanation. And Timaeus continually says that his cosmogony that he presents is a likely story, um, mm-hmm. which is it sort of ties back to this theme of truth within mythology. And Timaeus talks about the difficulty of knowing anything about these kind of subjects where you're talking about the birth of the universe. How can we really talk about this? We can only access a likely story because we aren't God. So we weren't there. Mm. And I don't know. Okay. Does that tie back to what we were talking about? Enough. (laughs) Enough. Enough. Because I think that's, I mean, that's really interesting generally, because then it makes me just think of of Atlantis, because obviously, like, my brain is going to tie all this back to Atlantis, because I haven't even read the full Timaeus, let alone any other Plato. Um, But, I mean, like, so it just remind me, if you think of it, but, like, when Critias then follows up Timaeus's whole speech with the story of Atlantis like is he presenting a likely story or is he like going for the opposite or not interested in the same way it just makes me wonder about like what that is meant to be like his he's presumably talking about or he's you know he's saying he's talking about his own memory but are is there yeah. like a sort of suggestion that it's like an unlikely or a likely story or what was the other one you said <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I, so they're both likely stories. One is more like a, a likely explanation, the right, logos piece right. of it, or a likely story, mythos. And people have a lot of arguments about why he's using mythos and logos. In any right. case, um, I do want to put one caveat, which I think about all mm-hmm. the time. Like Plato wrote this unfinished trilogy, unless we lost some of it, which is possible. And I just mm-hmm. spend years of my life thinking about this thing that Plato just decided to stop writing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so when we were talking about the Critias especially, like, okay, what is this? And we're just driving ourselves crazy. He yeah. would have loved that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because, I mean, like, God, the extent to which, like, I, I often think about, like, if if Plato could learn what this has become, 
Right. Like, yeah. I mean, it, just the story of Atlantis generally, like, and what it is now and like what misconceptions people have about it because of the, of what it has become. Like, I, I mean, I'm fascinated by the idea of like what he would think about it. You know, would he just think it's hilarious because he had all these intentions to just immediately like, like maybe the Critias ends with, haha, joking, you know, like not actually, but like maybe he's <laughs> well, like, and this was and... all an example of bullshit, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. maybe that was his whole intention is like for Critias to fin like finish his whole story of the destruction of Atlantis and all these different things. And then just be like, and that was an example of X. And, you know, like that was an example of a totally made up story or, right. you know, I, right. I mean, it's not likely, but like, there's just so many things that, that he could have been intending that would change every single thing we think of when it comes to Atlantis, which in itself is wild to, that it is the story that it is given it only appears in these two weird unfinished dialogues yeah yes yes and it's such a it's such a footnote in all of plato's yeah. work yeah it's <laughs> and like there not a thing you want to read <laughs> in plato's work that yeah. are like way more in the myth of air is like way more influential but i find it fascinating <laughs> i also there's a there's a part in the timaeus in the critias where in the myth of Atlantis, he's talking about how the names that we only know about this through the names that remain. Mm -hmm, I find that part right. really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't remember what these names actually mean. But then he goes through and he talks about what the names, how the names relate. And that's very, that's what Hesiod does all the time, right? Mm -hmm. He's always explaining why something is what it is based on the name and a sort of fake etymology for the name so it's not mm -hmm. an etymology in the way that we think of an etymology but it's like aphrodite is named aphrodite because she was born from the foam which is called aphros um and she's smile loving because the word for smile is also related to that that name and so there's this thing that plato's doing as well where he's like, oh, these names are how we still have this inkling to this story. And so mm -hmm. again, I think he's mimicking how myth is told in the sources that we have that are canonical for his time. And so mm -hmm. what he would be experiencing, he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to make this sound really legit. And so that's mm -hmm. why I say he would be really excited if people... When people believe that it's really legit. But, you know, it's, I find the, the framing around it so much more interesting than the myth itself, which is not most people. <laughs> no, I, um, I completely agree. Like, I absolutely, like, that's the thing that blew my mind most because I, you know, am, like, the of the age group, we're basically the same age, like, of, of like, coming across Atlantis 100% through pop culture through the Disney movie specifically and and just like this notion that even if it like that I I, was, I never assumed it was history but I did assume it was a Greek myth because it is presented mm -hmm. like a Greek myth whenever mm -hmm. you think about it it's so commonplace in terms of like oh you have an underwater city it's Atlantis uh, mm -hmm. like Oh, you have a lost city. It's Atlantis. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's just so common. And so I just like fully assumed it was a Greek myth. And then I, I think like I learned it was just in Plato. And then I was like, okay, well, Plato must present it like it's a myth. And like even he is not doing that. Like you read it, and it's just like 
he's just so clearly like setting mm-hmm. up this whole like long-winded and like narratological advice or a device where he's like th- th- I'm trying to prove a, a different point and I'm mm-hmm. gonna do it through this mm-hmm. and and now the more I hear from you like and this kind of leads to another question I meant to ask earlier because I mean I I definitely like without the background of like why and when he was producing this um which I probably should have looked up but I didn't um, I'm happy to but- tell you well, yeah, even just what you've shared now, I'm like, great, this is a perfect extra context I could have used. And so I'm thrilled to have this now. <laughs> um, but like, it, he, you know, to me, reading it just f- straight, he's just so obviously like pumping up at Athens and being like, look how cool we are, which now hearing this background of like, well, it was performed at the Panathenia, like, yes, like, okay, clearly he's like, look how cool we are. <laughs> kind of. But maybe not. So... I have some notes, I think. Of, Great. I'm, I'm, this is the part that I haven't, I haven't finished this section and I'm mm. still researching this. And I, I have, you know, with Plato, it's always so tricky because you can never say Plato says, or mm-hmm, that's right. just an impossible yeah. thing. Um, but I'm Man, very interested with the character choices that he uses right. as yeah, right. clues to the arguments that he's making. But he's writing this at a time when everything has fallen apart in Athens. Right. Um, you know, like they have lost. They won the Persian War and then they lost the Peloponnesian War and mm-hmm. then democracy failed. And then there was the tyrant. Now democracy is, I think we're in the time of like just after the 30 tyrants. And so a lot of people were just killed. Like things got really bad. Things are really bad. <laughs> And he's setting this dialogue in a prior time. And Hemocrates, we haven't talked about, but he's another guy. Right. He's one of the Because he people. might as well not be there, but like also mm-hmm. he's there. Yeah. <laughs> he's there, but Hemocrates, he's a Syracusan general during the Athenian Sicilian expedition in the midst of the Peloponnesian War. So he's a character in the Timaeus and the Critias. He he doesn't have a big part. He's just a bit part right. player. But he's the one who Plato decided not to write his speech. Yeah. So Hermocrates is supposed to have a speech at yeah. the end of this. And yeah, so when Athens sent so- an armada to conquer Sicily, Hermocrates called for the expanding of the anti-Athenian coalition. He sent ambassadors to Sparta, Corinth, Carthage, and Italy seeking allies. Interesting. So, yeah, so he's on the other would've... side of this war, right? That they've just lost. So he was not Athenian? We get a reference to Hermocrates from Thucydides, where he appears mm-hmm. at the Congress of Gela. And he's demanding that the Sicilian Greeks stop their quarreling and unite against the Athenians mm. who had been attacking the Sicilian cities in support of Corinth. Okay, just I wanted to check to make sure I was right about that because it's yeah. really strange, right? Yeah. So um, we've got this Sicilian, and this is a huge thing in the Peloponnesian War, the Sicilian expedition. This is where everything goes to shit. Um, and Alcibiades does some bad things, <laughs> and I'm not an expert, so I'd have to have prepped more to talk about this cogently, and don't take away my PhD. Um, but um, yeah, so basically, but this is a huge point in the Peloponnesian War, and the fact that we've got this Sicilian general as one of the people who's talking to Socrates, the Athenian, they're talking about Solon, the Athenian lawgiver, and mm-hmm. Timaeus is another figure who he he is fictional, so he didn't mm-hmm. really exist, but he's given this backstory of being a philosopher and a general. And then Critias, who most mm-hmm. people think this isn't the Critias of the Thirty Tyrants, but again, an Athenian who, um, if it at at l- very least, it's evoking a very famous name. Mm-hmm. that Plato's readers at that time are going to be really aware of. So mm-hmm. these character choices are very emotional for everyone involved, right? Yeah. Like we're in a war situation that just ended very poorly. 
things are really bad. And this is set at a time before that happens. Yeah. And then we're given this story of Atlantis fighting. And, you know, so there's this naval warfare element. There's this, um, you know, I don't know how to put like it, it. Unfortunately, we don't have the end of it. <laughs> yeah, we don't really have the Athenians much in it. Right, exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. So so we're missing that piece, but this is supposed to be an illustration of the people that Timaeus has described coming into existence. So we've got a cosmogony from the birth of the universe leading to how human beings are created um, and then how women and animals are created as a very short joking footnote at the end of that cool. which i do cool. want to come back to because you mentioned that the critias could just end in a joke the timaeus ends in a joke um and so but then these are supposed to be these people fully fleshed out and fighting and and having this warfare so yes but maybe we can come back to the timaeus ending in joke please so okay so then this kind of like adjusts my theory, which again, like obviously my, my version of theory is just like the thing I thought of without, um, you know, knowing all that much background on the history side, because really mythology is my thing. And I really just decided to dive right into history with Atlantis, not history, but history with Plato. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> but so then it sounds more like what he's doing is more like evoking the varied times when Athens was well I guess not even with the Critias question or the Hermocrates one because it, it otherwise though like because the story that Critias tells obviously is like from what we have is pretty pro Athens and like even they set it up in the Timaeus as being pretty pro Athens as well sure so it's almost yeah. more like this like Athens was so great you know when they fought Atlantis but then it sounds like it's pro at L Athens now, but then also the use of these characters suggests that there's like something else going on in there. Obviously, there is some like lots yes. going on there because it's played yes. anyway. Okay, thank you for yeah. bringing me back around to that because I forgot Beautiful. why we were talking about her. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think that that's what's happening, it's very on the surface pro Athens mm. and then there are these subtle critiques with the character choices mm -hmm. and, it, and it also seems like it's like critiques also in the way they describe Athens in the time of Atlantis because it's like a very different city right it's like it's almost like you can based on the description like a, a more modern word that you could use is like almost communism in or Marxism because he's very much like everyone has their own place. Everyone fits into the system. Like obviously he tosses in his whole like, Oh, and there's only ever this many people. And you're like, well, how do you keep it that way? There's a lot happening in there, <laughs> but like he, the way he describes the city is such a utopia, such like a perfect setup for how, um, like how a culture should thrive and all these different things, which is like, it very notably different from from any of the Athens that he's experienced, like democracy or otherwise. Right. Yeah. And and this is also ties into the Republic because mm -hmm. a lot of people talk about how this description of a city is a reiteration of the description of the ideal city in the republic it's like a revision but, right because he gets rid of the philosopher kings well it's it's very it's very strange because mm. it it's just different it's sort of like i'm i'm telling the same story but it's missing a bunch of things and it's not the same there's a an argument by Gregory Nagy, where he talks about how this is like a fictionalized version of the Republic, which I kind of like because of these other aspects of sort of fictionalizing the myth of the Timaeus. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, to this day, I'm very confused as to, it seems like it's placing these, it's, it's a note to go reread the Republic. Right. It's like a plug. Hey, remember, this is making you think of another work. So read that one and think about how we've defined justice there. Um, how we've talked shit about the poets there. <laughs> Um, and I'm very interested in that piece because he calls the poets demiurges in the Republic, um, which is the same word that he uses for the craftsman who's the creator of the cosmogony in mm. this man. And so there seems like this both. And again, with the the criticism of the poets on its face, you can say Plato criticizes the poets and says, you know, they they tell these bad stories about the gods and they make the gods look bad in this these myths but then again there are ways that Plato is always referring to Homer and Hesiod throughout his works and so it's similar that at first it seems like a criticism but there's always these subtleties to Plato mm-hmm mm-hmm well, and then, like, I mean, and again, I haven't read this, but the it seems to me that the craftsmen could also, like, be connected with the poets because the poets are also, like, inventing this story. Um, yes, exactly. Like, you know, quote-unquote inventing. Yeah. But, yeah, so he's almost, like, and it's interesting to use the same word then because it's it's like, well, are you then talking about a poet but in the framework of the craftsman the creator or yes. whatever it was yeah and there are even points in the Timaeus I think they're both in the Timaeus and not in the Critias where the characters talk shit about Homer and Hesiod they mm. say in relation to the myth of Atlantis they say if Solon had focused on uh his poetry and not been distracted when he came back to Athens, oh, which again is like, oh, he had some work to do as the Athenian lawgiver. And he came back to Athens. Mm-hmm. Um, there's all this stuff. Well, I have to look into this more, the Solon piece. And so he goes away, he's forced to go away, and then he comes back. And, uh, but they say, he would have been the best. Homer and Hesiod yeah. would have been nobodies if Solon had come back and he wasn't distracted and he kept up with his poetry. Um, and then there's another part in the Timaeus where they say, like, you know, Homer and Hesiod, not very good. So again, it's like a it's yeah. a competition with these people who didn't ever live and also died 400 <laughs> years ago. And like. I, in the Solon bit, I remember too because it is very specifically like if he hadn't gotten distracted, he would have written down this story of Atlantis, and he would have been the best. Like it's so specifically about, right. like yeah. it would be we would have the full story of Atlantis because Critias is like, well, I don't totally know if I remember it right. It's too bad we don't have Solon yeah. having written it down, which is so interesting. <sighs> yeah, I mean that Plato just really messes with your mind, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yes and i think so and and that again is this theme of like it's a likely story it's mm. probable we heard it somewhere there's this hearsay they keep calling the myth of atlantis hearsay which is really interesting yeah and and this kind of ties back to a theme that we find in hesiod because there there's also an interesting of narratological thing that happens when the muses talk to the poet who's called mm-hmm. Hesiod and they come down and they call the poet a, a belly a hungry belly and they say we know how to tell lies that look like the truth we know how to tell the mm-hmm. truth when we want to and also when we want to lies that look like the truth that seem like the truth and so there's this setup really early in the theogony where it both gives a a history of how this story is coming to 
into existence and it tells you why you should believe in it because there's a link between the muses and Zeus. And so this is, you know, coming from the gods, but also maybe you shouldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. So there's always this play with like truth and what the truth is about these stories and whether, you know, they're, they're always thinking through what, what even does truth mean when we're talking about myths? Mm -hmm. Which God is a good question when we're talking about Atlantis, Lord. Right, exactly. So even even in Plato and even 400 years before that, <laughs> yeah, when they're not talking about Atlantis, but they're even then asking, you know, what is the truth about this story? And does this story ha even make sense to ask whether it's true? Mm -hmm. So what you're saying too about the um, hearsay thing, so I, I don't know more than I read a footnote recently in, I was covering Al the Alcestis, um, and, and like, there's a moment, no, is it the Alcestis? No, or no, it's the, it was the, um, it was the Trachinii that I think this one was in, where it was like, uh, it, the, um, Dianera wants proof that Heracles, like has been poisoned um and she like won't believe it from anyone who heard that it happened like she has to talk to somebody who saw it happen and then there was this the footnote that said that like um in athens like hearsay was like just totally invalid or something like that but it was just like a particular dig at the idea of hearsay being like recognized um, so I don't know, I don't know about like how widespread that was or how specific it was or, or what have you, but it's just interesting to then hear that Plato was talking so much about hearsay and like, if it is, if it is like accurate that in Athens that hearsay was particularly like not respected or not believed, then that kind of adds something more to, to his like, just, I mean, the whole, all of the Critias is hearsay, mm -hmm. let alone like yeah. I've been talking about it specifically. This is interesting. I don't know what I'd have to look up into sources that talk about hearsay in the law court setting. That is yeah. not an area of my expertise, but I do Fair. think that this might be different partially because of the emphasis on oral performance. Mm -hmm. Right. It's more about that. And, and learning from oral performance and like learning a poem and memorizing it. And then that that happening, it's hard for us to even conceptualize. But, you know, if you're in an oral culture primarily, then you're not memorizing based on writing things down. Mm -hmm. You're memorizing because you're, you're listening to them. Um, but I do, but there is, there is also, it's, it's also this, it's also, um, Plato is not, he makes it more challenging to say anything about this. Mm -hmm. Plato makes it hard to say anything about this because <laughs> he's like, oh, I learned this from hearsay and, uh, this story was learned from hearsay, uh, but I learned it as a child. So I remember it really well because we all know. Everyone knows that the things you learn as a child are stick in your memory. But at the same time, Critias says that. And he says, I don't know that I remembered this yeah. correctly. Yeah. And I had to, you know, tell, I had to practice telling this story. And it was through telling the story that I remembered it. And so there we got, we've got like both oral performance, memory, and forgetting all at mm. once. Which, again, Plato's making my job really hard. Yeah, really. God, I can't imagine. Like, I had so much trouble just with reading this one piece. Uh, like, yeah, because he's just, there's just so many layers. And then also, like layered. you were saying. It's very layered. Yeah, and like you were saying, like, you can't say Plato said blank because Plato never says anything himself. 
But you also can't say Solon said. No, exactly. You can't say Socrates said. Like, yeah, it exactly. just reminds me of a great joke um, that uh, the Ben of the memes on Twitter, uh, <laughs> classical studies memes shared, which is just that um, Socrates was invented by Plato to sell more philosophy. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. Uh, like, it just feels very <laughs> accurate because it's like, what, like, what did anyone actually say, though, Plato? Like, you included. Like, what are you, what is your actual opinion on something mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. opinions that you want to play with through the voices of others? Because, mm -hmm. like, if the Critias is anything, it feels like a just a thought experiment. Like, you can't actually tell what Plato thought about anything. Like, he's just, like, playing with ideas and, and just putting them into other people's voices so that he can play with ideas. Because if you make a bunch mm -hmm. of people say totally different things, you can have this, like, really wild back and forth of ideas and, and just, like, just completely mess around with everything by putting them in other people's voices and then make everyone's life a lot harder 2,500 mm -hmm. years later. Well, it's very funny, too, because the Timaeus becomes so influential that it really, it has this vast impact on monotheism and mm. creationism. Mm. Um, and people really want the Timaeus to be what Plato thought and what Plato said and presenting this cosmogony and building off of that both in the Roman world and going forward so they want that character to be a a mouthpiece for Plato but they also mm -hmm. and it also attracts this dialogue attracts like the worst philosophy bros Plato? <laughs> because it's so Plato attracts um, <laughs> bad philosophy bros? What are you talking about? <laughs> The, the worst, the worst. Um, and, you know, some of my best friends. Um, <laughs> um, but part of it is they get, people get really trapped in this web of trying to pull out the arguments and they make these arguments in philosophical, di in philosophical papers that, that I have to read then um, <laughs> that are like, this is what the meaning of the Timaeus is. And He's using ekos muthos here and ekos logos here, and it has this really important meaning and the elements, and these are a bunch of references to the pre-Socratics, which is all interesting. But as a my classicist approach to it, like coming from a classics background, is mm -hmm. it's set at a festival. What does mm -hmm. it mean that it's set at this festival and that we have these character choices? And then that you know, so there's this weird, really weird thing at the end of the Timaeus where he talks about how women come into existence. He's already gone through everything else except women and animals. Sure. Um, and he even says, like, oh, I don't need a lot of time to talk about this. This is very minor, <laughs> very minor point. <laughs> and it's, like, incredibly misogynistic, the Timaeus part of the Timaeus, his speech. And there's actually parts at the beginning of the Timaeus with Socrates where it's much less misogynistic. He says women can do the same things as men. Um, they can have their bodies tuned or their women can be tuned in the same way, which is a big mm. theme in the Timaeus is this sort of celestial tuning. In any case, at the end, mm. when he's talking about how women come to be, it's through a kind of de-evolution that the okay. bad men mm -hmm, mm -hmm. become women and then the worst ones become animals. And so that's how we get everything else. And people are <laughs> like, well, what do we do with this part? I like that they want to hold up and they're like this is the story of how the world comes to be but just ignore that and the commentators on this part it's very interesting because they're just so embarrassed we also at this point get the introduction of the wandering womb that oh. the the story of yes um yeah why yeah so like 
what's going on with reproductive organs and how sperm is this ensouled thing that brains it's like yes wow. okay maybe we shouldn't get into that part no but please very, i mean okay. i this is like i'm here for it um yeah so the the sperm part is like it's the same stuff as the brains and that comes through i won't i guess give this link to my mom um (laughs) like uh the men have this lively desire for emission um and with but that is their brains yeah 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 okay and the the womb wanders but both are called so we've got this very the womb is is an animal an indwelling animal that wanders when women haven't given birth and they want to um but the the male reproductive organs are also indwelling animals so there is a little bit a little bit less misogyny than it might first appear but then cool. reproduction comes about um and there's there's no explanation from Timaeus about this kind of chicken and egg problem about how we get the first woman if there's no you know how do bad men yeah the next generation becomes women but yeah. there's there's no logical does not fill the logical gap of how the first generation gives birth to the second generation yeah um but it's an impossible thing to explain yeah yeah cuz it's all so that's bizarre. the thing <laughs> yeah it's an impossible thing to explain and they're trying in this dialogue to explain things that are impossible to explain which is also what a cosmogony is Mm -hmm. yeah you know and so like when we get these anthropogonies and these cosmogonies it's not possible logically to give a analytical explanation of this and mm-hmm. so they have to come back to a version of myth if we're describing myth as a story that's an explanation. Yeah. Wow, there's just so much in there. <laughs> okay. Sorry, going back to another question that I think helps with all of this. So how was Plato's all of this disseminated? Like, so, oh, and how, so, okay, it's set at a festival, but we're not, it's not set, like, publicly at a festival, right? It's, like, after the festival. It's, like, an evening. Yeah, they're having a banquet, and they had a banquet the previous night, and the previous night, Socrates had, had given them the speech, and so now they have this feast of speeches. And this is the second night where they're repaying Socrates uh, with the right. feast of speeches. Um, the question of how Plato's work was disseminated is a very good one. And it's so funny with classics. I don't know. <laughs> um, like, you would think this would be like a very something you would learn first. I'm glad to know that it's not, yeah, that's just like somehow I've missed this. (laughs) Um, So with classics, it's so funny because, you know, we know things based on whether people refer to them offhand in a comedy, Mm -hmm. things like this. You Mm -hmm. know, are they talked about in a treatise? Does Plato himself talk about them? A lot of our sources for the performance of poetry at festivals come to Mm -hmm. come to us through plato because Mm. he has characters who are rhapsodes or he sets things at festivals and so it's interesting that it's not as though anything survives that's like here is the explanation of the panathenia but we cobble these things together by uh, material remains when we can find like oh we've got a list of the people who won this event mm-hmm. written on a stone <laughs> that's also not my area of expertise but I think that happens <laughs> um, as far as I know as well certainly with tragedy that's what I've gathered 
<laughs> yeah. And so with Roman things, you know, we've got more images of what scrolls look like mm. and how I assume that Plato's work is written on a scroll and both most of the reading culture in both Greece and Rome. I'm going to make this statement. You can fact check me. I may be wrong. Most of the reading culture. I make a lot of statements like that. (laughs) But I should know. Most of the reading culture is reading aloud. So there's much less reading quietly by yourself and a lot more uh, reading aloud socially. Um, And, you know, books are, there's not codexes. So in the same structure as we have with a book with pages, but rather uh, scrolls where you've got a, you're rolling it open and you've got like a block of text and then one block. Oh, is that how it went? Mm -hmm. Um, There's no spaces in between words. Yeah, that's fun. Also that. um, No punctuation. So you do have these sort of like blocks of text and then each book is a scroll. Right. But I don't know, you know, how much, who has access to what scrolls or how Mm -hmm. how these dialogues are disseminated i'm very intrigued by the relationship between didactic oral poetry like he see it Mm -hmm. where he's talking about concepts like justice he Mm -hmm, there is no he in he see it but Mm -hmm. he is talking about concepts of justice what is justice um sort of trying to there's there's these questions how does the world come into existence who are the gods, um, genealogies, and philosophers take up similar questions and run with them once we get the development of writing. But does the philosophical dialogue relate in form to a practice of philosophizing through oral poetry is one of my main questions. Mm-hmm. How would we even talk about that? But I think there's there's more of a continuity in that time period um, in how philosophical thought develops over time than is recognized. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because you brought, like, how much you brought up about, like, the fact that he's really commenting so much on oral tradition and everything and like this whole idea of the speeches after the festival and all that it's just so interesting then to look at like okay but how is his work like shown and and like what yeah like how broad was was like knowledge of what he's saying and and it's especially because um like because he's making all of his works are these dialogues. Like it is so interesting to think about then it being read aloud, Mm -hmm. even just to like convey the information Mm -hmm. and just, yeah. And I mean, because I mean, that's so foreign or not, not foreign, but like, it's just so different when, when you're thinking about like, certainly what I do, which is like all oral storytelling and like what has come down Mm -hmm. through the myths and everything because then even just generally reading Plato I'm like oh right it's prose that's weird you know Mm -hmm. and like and that's so it's so interesting that I mean and I guess it's just sort of like the nature of what he's doing but that you know he is writing in prose and like disseminating information but also commenting upon the ways that information is disseminated yes for sure and the the other thing about the philosophical dialogue that's really interesting and that is again a trap is that it's a genre and there's all of these conventions and it's very artificial Mm. so it's not as though he's recording speech right he might make it seem like that by having people say, of course, Socrates, or, you know, there's all of these kind of interjections. Um, but, and if you read it, it does not read like how people talk. He's not trying mm-hmm. to make it realistic. Mm-hmm. 
it's not about that. It's about how to do philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know that I think this is like a still a question of how to do philosophy well. And personally, as someone who's very on the side of there's a big divide in the world of philosophy, and, and I really am super tangential to the world of philosophy, <laughs> sitting over here being like, it's set at a festival. <laughs> you haven't read Hesiod. <laughs> well, like, that's why I'm talking to you. Like, I don't need to talk to philosophers. I want to hear the classic side of it, the history side of it. But as you're talking about, like, it's, you know, so how is philosophy done now? There's people in the analytic schools of philosophy. Here, I'm going to talk shit again. The way that people do philosophy is so strange and so artificial. And there's these generic conventions of how we set up a formal argument about things. And only people who are trained professionally to read these philosophical articles can make sense of them, articles and books. And you might have a question about what is gender? And that's a philosophical question. You may have a question about why are stories told in the way that they're told? How do we actually disseminate knowledge and what does that mean? And the answers to those questions in the formal sphere of philosophy right now most is most popularly, at least in the academy, being told in this weird format and so when we think about mm -hmm. the philosophical dialogue and Plato's use of myths, this mm -hmm. is a thing that I'm really interested in because he's mimicking the way that Homer and Hesiod are telling these stories, sort of, mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. these allegories to then get his point across. Mm -hmm. Right? And so he's got a different technique. But I honestly... I mean, we can argue that it's hard, as we've said, reading the Timaeus, not the most fun. Um, reading the Critias, uh, the little that survives, also strange. <laughs> it's better in yeah, the it's something else. But maybe not worth spending 10 years of your life for, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so there's a different way that it's being done then these questions about this way of like delving into doing philosophy the other yeah. thing that's really interesting that that like the answer to all of plato's arguments is that doing philosophy is the best like the, the question is always like what is the best life and the answer is always philosophy duh <laughs> which is just it's such a cop out and it's like oh was this constructed to you know sell more philosophy to you know get more students to sign up for the next year of philosophy in their undergrad it worked on me <laughs> was plato just a capitalist icon <laughs> <laughs> the neoliberal universities uh they love him <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, oh. I, I don't know. I think Plato is, I would say, read the symposium. <laughs> I've read bits of it. I've read the soul bit. <laughs> yeah, the symposium is like a much more fun dialogue to read than the Timaeus or the Critias. <laughs> so, unfortunately, that, like, Aristophanes' soul bit did not become as famous. Another Aristophanes fact that I found really interesting that was brought up today the first reference we get to Socrates is from The Clouds by really? Aristophanes. Yes. So that's the first fictionalized Socrates. At least that's what a professor said in a class today that I'm TAing for. So mm. <laughs> she yeah. could be wrong. Well, <laughs> but yeah, fair enough. I don't think she's wrong. Um, so Plato's and there are many different fictionalized Socrateses, which is another mm -hmm. interesting thing. So the um, the Aristophanes Socrates is just horrible, such an asshole. <laughs> not that Plato Socrates is not an asshole, clearly also an asshole. 
Um, but the way that he's portrayed is very different in mm-hmm. different sources. And so this this also makes me wonder about your question of how are Plato's works being read and consumed and talked about, mm-hmm. especially in this time period, which is so close to Socrates' life, you know, and he's being fictionalized in this way where the sources are all so different. Mm-hmm. How are they talking about this then? Are they like, this is very strange, Plato, this way that you've gone about describing this guy we all know to be terrible. <laughs> Yeah, like how much do we actually know about Socrates beyond Plato? Um, I think that people, you know, gosh, you know, this isn't my area of interest to think about real people. (laughs) (laughs) I I respect that. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, think about the festival context. Um, But, you know, other people try to triangulate the sources around uh, Xenophon, Aristophanes, and Plato and say, you know, this is what this guy was. I think in some ways it's more, it's always more interesting to look at how things are received, even like in Mm -hmm. scholarship, to think through oftentimes especially with classics because our scholarship is so terrible (laughs) it's so old it goes so far back that there's a lot of misogyny in there too and racism and so when are you shocked old white men that are you developed classics were racist and misogynist yeah and it's it's very funny too like in these in these um commentaries when they're like they just totally exclude women from the group of people (laughs) who might be reading them you know (laughs) thank you so much for all of this It has been so much fun um i'm kind of just utterly thrilled that you decided to talk about the timaeus instead and then i got all this background on plato that i get to add to the whole atlantis situation so thank you thank you so much yes I'm so grateful that you invited me on the show. It was great talking with you, and I hope I can come back. Absolutely. Um, especially since you said you liked Ovid, too. So I don't know. Oh, yeah. talk about lots more. <laughs> um, well, great. why don't you tell my listeners, like, where people can find you to learn more or follow you or whatever you want to share or don't want to share is also fine. Every time somebody um, gives me that face, I'm like, you don't have to. <laughs> that's great. I do not want to be found. <laughs> no, <I'm> just- <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Washington, and if you have questions on the Timaeus or Plato in general, or myth in Plato, I do have a Twitter. I don't know what my Twitter handle is. I should know. <laughs> I mean, I can just, I'll put it in the episode's description as I always do. Don't worry about okay. it. Okay. <laughs> um, my Twitter is my name, but, you know, analytical philosophers don't at me <laughs> yeah they won't they don't listen to me don't worry <laughs> so yeah not after how i handled plato <laughs> uh, analytical philosophers don't like plato the enemy of my oh, okay. enemy is my friend yeah 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 mm. no no they're not all about that for the most part um but yeah yeah it was so great to talk with you about plato and about myth and i would love to come back and talk more about ovid or other things I am very glad because that was uh, very fun. And what the listeners don't know is that we also spent like a half an hour just like chatting about nothing beforehand. So <laughs> we really kept each other way too long. This has been very fun. <laughs> I have to go and, home like, to my cat. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, my cat's been yelling at me too. So yeah, yes. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Also follow my Twitter for pictures of my cat, who is the most beautiful cat. I, my cat is literally screaming at me. <laughs> I in this hear moment. her. Yeah. Yeah. You are being incredibly loud, sir. My God. Oh, this episode was so much fun to record. As I think you can tell throughout, but particularly at the end there, I had to cut out a bunch because honestly, we talked forever and about so many things and it was just 
So, so fun. I really hope to have Caitlin back on the show because I would absolutely love to talk to her about Ovid now. Whew. All a part that I had to cut out, but still exciting. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, learning more about Plato and how he did what he did, specifically about the Timaeus and how it connects with and mimics even Hesiod. Oh, it's all so fucking interesting. It's almost like the ancient world and the people who lived there were seriously fun to learn and think about, you know? Thank you all for listening because fuck, I love this so much. And huge thank you to Caitlin for joining me. What a fucking fun time we had for you. Let's Talk About Miss Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos to editing and research. And it's especially wonderful when she does those things last minute because I'm really bad at editing on time sometimes. <laughs> Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. You are all the best. This is so fun. How is this my job? I am Liv and I love this shit.